Dr. Henderson, welcome to the University of Richmond. Um, it's an honor for us to have you here today and to spend a little bit of time with you. Thanks, Jackson. Great to be here. Um, starting off, I know you spent a, a lot of time sort of discussing the young male syndrome. Mm -hmm. According to the American Psychological Association, males in their mid-teens to mid-20s are more likely to engage in high-risk behavior than other people. Mm -hmm. Could you briefly describe some of these risk-taking behaviors and explain why young men engage in them? The types of behavior, I mean, it encompasses everything from you know, participating in extreme sports to physical fights, verbal aggression, assault, even things like, uh, you know, there was there was this nice, nice graph I saw in a research paper I, I posted online um, about hospitalization for punching walls. Mm. And, you know, if you look at the distribution among males for, you know, likelihood of being hospitalized for punching a wall, it's like all concentrated among, you know, 15 to 25, you know, just aggression, a sort of uh, obliviousness to potential risk, to potential physical harm, and, and criminality as well is, is concentrated among young men. So a 20-year-old man in the U.S. is 10 times more likely to be arrested for a violent crime than a 60-year-old man, for example. And so this is uh, these are all sort of hallmarks of, of, of that syndrome that I'll be speaking about. Going off of that question, what effect, if any, do socioeconomic, cultural, or familial background have on the types and degree of young men's risk-taking behaviors? The things that I just mentioned, those are sort of broad aggregate patterns, those impulses among young men can be sort of exacerbated or inhibited by environmental conditions. Boys who are raised by single single parents, often usually single mothers, are far more likely to sort of receive disciplinary action in schools for disruptive behavior or aggression or fighting. Um, other, other inputs, uh, you know, sort of environmental conditions. Um, include sort of childhood instability. Instability is a far stronger predictor of future risk-taking behavior than uh, childhood poverty. So sort of that unstable early life experience. And if you, I mean, if you look at the statistics for, for foster care, for example, 60% of boys uh, who go through the foster care system are later incarcerated, 60%. And so if you look at um, boys who are raised in um, families in the bottom socioeconomic quintile, so basically boys who are raised in four families, you know, they are disproportionately likely to be incarcerated, but it's not anywhere near 60%. And so that sort of gives you an indicator of the dis difference between being poor versus living in extremely unstable environments. Uh, talking about the sort of foster care system, you have a fascinating story. And um, from foster care to graduating from Yale with a BS and Cambridge with a PhD, um, and I know you have a book coming out about it in February. Could you just touch on a little bit about both your book um, and just your story in general and how you were able to, uh, you know, become successful and what you attribute that success to? Uh, yeah. So, 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 yeah, my book's coming out February 20th, uh, Troubled, a memoir of foster care, family and social class. Yeah, this book sort of recounts my unusual uh, trajectory from, you know, growing up, growing up in foster homes in, in Los Angeles to later enlisting in the military and then going on to, to graduate from, from college and, and so on. And so, you know, people often ask me this question of, you know, what, uh, what was it about me that allowed me to have this sort of positive upward trajectory? And people ask me questions about social mobility. And I mean, it's funny, you know, the whole thing we've been talking about, the young male syndrome and impulsivity, I really think that one factor that I could attribute my sort of life direction to is impulsivity in that I made kind of a halfway impulsive decision to enlist in the military. It was not really well thought out. Right. <laughs> I mean, I was, I was 17. I barely graduated high school. I was, I mean, part of it was luck too. I mean, I had five close friends growing up. I was doing all of the same reckless and dangerous things they were doing. Um, but, you know, it's just sort of uh, luck and happenstance that I just didn't get in any sort of serious uh, legal trouble or, or, or physical harm. Two men that I respected in my life at this time uh, who were in the military. So I, my, my, my best friend's dad, he was a veteran and retired police officer. He sort of gently encouraged me mm -hmm. to enlist. And then I had a high school history teacher who uh, had served in the Air Force before uh, transitioning to a career in education. And he kind of pulled me aside and he was like, what are you doing, man? Like you have potential and you're screwing up your life. And like, you know, have you ever thought about maybe joining the military, the Air Force, something? And so, you know, I was 17 and I was thinking like, well, like the life that I have now isn't that great enough. I sort of try to see, foresee my life in five years from now, it's not going anywhere good. Mm -hmm. And so I sort of pushed the eject button and immediately put myself in a different environment with, you know, the military, the rigid structure, the rules, the norms, everything 
uh, sort of completely transform my environment. And later I did have to reflect a bit and, you know, it wasn't a completely costless transition, uh, which I, which I delve into in the book about, you know, it wasn't as if everything just went perfectly smoothly from there on out. There were some difficulties later. Um, but that was probably it is like a bit of luck and a bit of impulsivity. Well, Rob, thank you so much for spending some time with us today. We really appreciate it. And, uh, don't forget to check out his book coming out February 20th. Big Jackson.